Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from Islamabad Studios. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, the 32nd conference on uh, CPEC. Obviously it's a huge project as we all know. The very interesting dynamics about it. And uh, what exactly it's going to have, uh, I mean when we talk about the impact of CPEC in terms of economy, what exactly it's going to do? And how long will it take? And what so when you when you talk about the translation of, of CPEC, what exactly is that supposed to mean? Everybody talks about um, CPEC in terms of having a railway link or a road link or a connectivity uh, kind of a feature. But the point is that it's not only that. That is just a minor portion of it. I was watching an ad, a very interesting one. Somebody said and rather compared that uh, Gavada is going to be developed exactly on the same lines the way the Chinese developed Shanghai or the UAE developed Dubai. So what sort of challenges are we going to face in that regard? Obviously, nobody opposed uh, Dubai or nobody opposed uh, Shanghai at that time. But interestingly, when we talk about CPEC, which is going to definitely uh, benefit almost 2.5 billion people, you talk about the African nations or the Middle Eastern side, or you talk about the Central Asia, or you talk about China or Pakistan for that matter, a lot of people will benefit. Eventually, the, the standard and the lifestyle is going to change in this region. But there are a lot of uh, hindrances, there are a lot of issues, a lot of challenges. We'll be talking about that in detail in our today's program. On my right is Abdullah Yusuf Saab, he's an introduction, former head of uh, FBI, so thank you very much. And we also have with us uh, Dr. Akab, uh, a known analyst, thank you very much, sir. And we have with us uh, uh, Paracha Saab, again, he's an introduction, known anchor, uh, television personality as, a, as well as a senior journalist. So thank you very much, uh, Shokat Paracha, for, for taking out time and being a part of the show. So first of all, Abdullah Yusuf Saab, when we talk about CPAC, Obviously, the first thing which comes in my mind is like a road, a rather much better roads, starting from uh, top uh, all the way to, to Gavadar and, you know, a lot of industrial zones on the left and the right and people getting jobs. And obviously, a lot is going to improve in that. But, sir, having said that, is this the only, only way to look at CPAC or, or there is a different dimension, sir? Well, actually, uh, let me just clarify because as far as the CPAC project as a whole is concerned, it's almost 46 billion dollars sure. as a total value and out of that almost 34 billion dollars is for the energy energy uh, power sector right and the rest 12 billion or so is for the infrastructure which is roads and railways and uh, you know and the upgradation of the and, existing roads and yeah. of course the upgradation and with that uh, you go on to those roads you are also going to have those economic zones, uh, special economic zones or industrial zones on the sidelines. Now, you see, uh, if we look at the whole issue or the whole project, I think definitely it is one of those exceptional ones, historically speaking, for the nation, for the country. Of course, it will have a positive contribution for the economy, for the country. <clears throat> but then, at the same time, it is actually going to also benefit the other side of the, uh, the other country, which is China primarily. And of course, it can also work as a, you know, <coughs> linkage for the region also. When we look at uh, the, um, uh, the, what are the, the countries <laughs> joining us on the north, basically. The central uh, states and, and yes, primarily. so all those countries are also likely to be benefiting, mm -hmm. and uh, this is also then likely to create, uh, you know, from the countries, our country's point of view, uh, some uh, expansion in your um, growth, uh, your GDP, the size of the economy grows, and the, the the this type of growth becomes or brings in. Uh, the econ the increase in the economy and that of course then means that you are going to generate some extra employment and of course uh, it should also increase our GDP growth rate and so on. So we, we, when, we, when we present the idea of CPEC everything seems to be very hunky-dory, right? So talking about the economic zones, I just want to, your comment on this because uh, so many governments they decided to give certain economic zones to various countries also to Singapore, to Japan, to China and also to develop our own industry and you know that uh, the electricity will be subs uh, uh, you know there were certain uh, sort of uh, facilities which were provided 
uh, subsidized rates were given on on various. So uh, those are free trade ag that, agreements. No, no, sir. The FTA is different. I'm talking about within within Pakistan. Mm. But nothing happened on that front, sir. To, to be very honest, I mean, we couldn't capitalize. I mean, sir, we couldn't even capitalize on uh, GPS Plus when you talk about um, um, uh, GSP Plus uh, 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 when we had a contract with European countries of two billion, two point two billion dollars. We couldn't do much. So practically, the idea is great, but do you do you believe that there is some hindrance, some problem at the at the, at the working level, sir? Is that the real Actually, issue? Actually, uh, that is our basic issue in every field. I would say. That is our. Um, is it the attitude? It's a governance problem, okay. primarily, mm -hmm. and that, of course, certainly is something which we will have to focus on and try to actually ensure that we are going to also deliver on our side, because it's not going to be a one-sided story. Okay, they are, you know, the Chinese are going to be the investors, but then we are supposed to provide that support. Infrastructure support is going to be from our side also. All right, and then we have to facilitate that entire um, effort of the investor, and for that we have to provide also the security side. We have to then everything which is associated. Uh, you know, with it. everything which is associated, mm -hmm. and that always is a requirement from any investor's point of view, which we have to actually understand and okay. try to now. Uh, move forward mm -hmm. because there are a lot of hindrances and handicaps, and that also then affects your investors' you, you believe decision making. That the making. government is addressing those issues wisely and in appropriate fashion. Actually, sir? they are now wanting to do so, okay. and I hope, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. God willing, that there should be some outcomes. It's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be that simple and straightforward. Exactly, it definitely will be a challenge, but then. We have to take the challenge because it's absolutely necessary. All right, moving on. Lots of pros and cons. Obviously, when you evaluate, uh, or, or whenever there's there's a project of, of this size of this magnitude, obviously, which we call is going to be a game changer, and it is going to be a game changer, provided if it's done the right way. Whatever is on the paper, if it's implemented the right way, yes, sir, we will see that that kind of growth. But what sort of hindrances do you feel we will face, or are we facing at the moment, sir? You've got to understand that things are coming about now. Um, the planning is there, Gwadar's being made, the port's being made, the airport is, everything's on the ground, things are starting to work, meaning people are starting to construct things according to a particular plan. And this is the same with the routes coming down the roads and motorways. And it's going to be a slow development because it's going to take a fair few years. All right. So we're, nothing's going to just erupt and just immediately change. There's going to be a transition between what we are now and what we can be. But this also... And this is going to take decades, right? Well, it could take a, a, around two decades before we see any real success in it, I think. Okay. Because once it starts, uh, the work is done on the ground in the next 10 years or so, and then you'll see a gradual change, there's no doubt, when the energy aspects turn around and we don't have an energy shortfall and we're actually seeing some return in that and those promises are being fulfilled right. as they are beginning to... Um, that's when we're going to start seeing things. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about uh, problems, uh, let me tell you the truth. I find that our culture cannot execute policies and execute plans and not, cannot construct the way the Chinese want to construct things. Uh, uh, define that, that part of culture. The fact of the matter is... Culture, is that the attitude which we have? The attitude is the that everybody wants a little piece of the game, but nobody wants to do anything about it. Yeah? And so the Chinese want to come and to fix it, they are of a strategic necessity. And uh, CPEG is part of a larger picture of One Belt, One Road, which is going to expand everywhere in Central Asia to Europe, the whole Eurasian uh, continent, Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, will be linked in. That's the whole idea. This is one pivot point. This is the very important point because this is the model. This is what you're going to, if you have a success here. So this I totally agree. This is going to be a but great model. But, 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 but I'm, just going to, I'm just going to add another thing here. Yeah. If you remember, Yusuf Reza Gilani was the Prime Minister, and I'm talking about the Pakistan People's Party's government. Uh, there was this idea, rather, the, the train went via Iran all the way to Turkey. And I think it, ju it just went once, and that's it. What have we done on that front? So, I mean, it's brilliant. You're talking about the entire uh, uh, European region and access to, to that. Nothing happened on that. Right after that. But who's taking the leadership in this now? 
It is the second largest economic power in the world. It's got clout. It's <clears> got <throat> vision. And the truth is, the world needs it. The world wants it. They want economic benefit. We are realizing war is not an answer to anything. Conflict is not an answer. It's a destructive force. It got us this far. That's the end. We need to move on beyond it now. Economic means, economic density, fulfilling your country's needs, providing services. Everybody demands that now, and the people are, are aware of it. And that's what we're trying to fulfill. And this is going to make everything interconnected. Interconnectivity makes the world become one. There may be one or two powers that are not in agreement with this, especially in Asia, where they can be sidelined, and they have to come into it eventually because they're going to lose out. And you know who that is. The fact of the matter is, this is the big game now. You talked about the great game in the 18th, 19th century with the British and the Russians, etc. Afghanistan was in the middle of it. This is a much bigger game than that. That was a contest of power between, between opposing forces. This is a unification of the world. As I see it, the long-term vision is a unification of the world. We need to unify it even further through interconnectivity, mixing of people, mixing of goods, trading in a way that we've never traded before. This is what's going to bring, and Pakistan is the fulcrum point right now because this is the model. This is the first one. This is a success. So that's a very optimistic that's going approach. To lead to it. But, but Prajasa, I mean, you've done so many shows on that. You've been extensively writing about that as well. What sort of challenges do you see, sir? We do understand this is going to be a game changer, and you know, I've been reading about it. certain sentences which are always there whenever any politician is talking about them, but. The real issues. I'm talking about the real challenges, sir. You know, two, three aspects, the worthy guests, they have elaborated very well. For example, Dr. Saab has talked about leadership, that, sure. that Chinese, this is the uh, Xi Jinping, president of Chinese vision that one belt, one uh, road is the concept and they are uh, spearheading it. Secondly, when you talk of challenges, uh, there is a misconception in Pakistan in terms of domestic challenges that the smaller provinces or some opposition political parties, uh, they are against this project. Nobody is against this project. Everyone is showing ownership and asking for more share. Let us be very clear about that. If the government of KPK or the, exactly the political parties mm -hmm. in Balochistan, if they are saying that uh, give us more share and uh, we do not want the, the present structure of the shares among the provinces, it is by no mean an opposition to the, the project. All right. They want ownership, they want more industry to be built, more zones to be constructed so that there could be, as you were talking, more and more employment generation. Mm -hmm. Starting with 46 billion dollar or so, now the actual 54. investment is gone to 54. So <coughs> it's ending. <coughs> Secondly, uh, it's not for Pakistan, and it's not only for Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Look at the tremendous interest that the Everywhere. powers in our region mm -hmm. and beyond. They are, for example, Johnson was here. I'm talking of British Foreign Secretary. Yes. What did he say about this project? He said, we also we want, want to be a part, part of it. it. Look at the interest generated in Central Asia and beyond. Yeah. Central Even Asian, right. you know, Turkmen president was here. Uzbek leadership was here. Tajikistan president was here, Imam Ali Rahman. And they are now asking Pakistan that please uh, uh, do some something for us that we can be connected to this uh, corridor of pros countries, prosperity, basically. you know. Mm -hmm. There was a problem, now I am coming to the regional problem. The, the problem, the challenge you are talking of, Afghanistan used to be a big challenge for our... It still our, is a challenge and no, I guess let it me, will let me complete, a Let me complete, let me complete. It is not a challenge, it is no more a challenge now. What we have done in, in literal terms, we have bypassed Afghanistan. Yes. We have been to Kashgar and from Kashgar we are connecting to Central Asia. Once you are in Tajikistan, you are connected to entire Central Asia up to Moscow. Correct. Because their infrastructure, their is, connectivity yes. is tremendous one. It was five years back that 50, 40, 25 truck convoy, it started from Belgium and reached up to Central Asia through Tarasic route. So, Tarasic route is open last five years. There is a heavy transport over there. And, if and it's you functional 24-7 uh, and uh, throughout oh, the season, even in a, winters. It's a trim. Go like to like the we, Google. We go closed to the down Google. this. Uh, uh, go to the Google. Karakram Highway for four months in winters. 
you know like with the expansion project with the expansion project and construction of further projects on cpac right. i mean you never know one day there is a fast train for example there is a train service as they are trying it hmm. some 30 years back nobody thought that gilgit and islamabad will be connected round the year but now look at the traffic you know, look at the the expansion of the roads so it's not only for pakistan and not only uh, in pakistan whenever this project is completed this will change the whole region afghanistan i am telling you it used to be a challenge but it's bypassed now to kashgar and kashgar to central asia india tried to be a challenge they went to china they went to other parts of the world they took up personally at the level of foreign minister and prime minister and they spoke to chinese leadership that that what are you doing in the gab of cpac but chinese leadership stood firm yes. with its friendship with pakistan they have a very clear and now now you know when we say challenges are there we also see that the first convoy of so many big trawlers and first you know the chinese trucks <laughs> that, that's what i'm saying you know that has already been been departed mm-hmm. from gwadar mm-hmm. so gwadar is from, and today especially mm-hmm. since you are holding this show today look at you know a, the commitment from chinese and commitment from our leadership that prime minister was supposed to be there due to bad weather prime he minister could, could not flew but there. military leadership was there the ownership taken by general rahil sharif and now general kamar bajwa and others you know chairman joint chiefs of staff committee was also there yep. this is the commitment by the pakistani leadership both military and political when i say political leadership mm-hmm. it's not only the ruling party president zardari used to visit every 3 months chinese china in different projects the only president who been to china so many times so many times so entire political leadership in pakistan backed fully by the military leadership this project will see the light and of supported the day. by all the political parties that is the best <coughs> part but sir uh, uh, now uh, since this uh, uh, idea was floated much earlier and everybody used to talk about that you know Ch- chinese will develop their western side and eventually this is the way forward because when you look at that side uh, china is also facing a lot of problem when you talk about uh, the issues in the south china sea or for instance i mean there was a very interesting story um, in in cnn about uh, that um, uh, that one china policy of the usa hmm. how do you see that aspect sir trump mr trump being the president for next 4 years the chinese leadership they have they have a certain design pakistan is coming uh, into this entire um, uh, i would say game as as a as a real stakeholder the growing uh, relationship between the indians and the americans so it seems this could be another indirect battleground sir economic battleground for for all these countries do you look at it that way well actually if we overall see the global situation definitely it has to go through a change is it going through already sir it has to go through right. <laughs> going forward mm-hmm. because you know what you have seen if you look at the whole world situation the western side that is america europe uk etc they've all uh, done pretty well and they've grown and they've achieved they've those type of first two uh, countries peak levels correct right but then you come on to this side uh, the far east and middle east and, and you know <laughs> this part of the world they have yet to grow a lot and there is definitely a huge potential Absolutely. and there is a huge gap yes. at the moment so china india pakistan bangladesh these sri lanka countries, etc yeah. now all these countries are having that potential and now the time i feel is for these countries also to come up and when these other developed countries when they are now looking at their own uh, you know side of the situation they are obviously getting bit worked up i would say yeah and they are trying to see how they can you know uh, manipulate a bit to try and avoid this type of uh, situation actually taking place mm-hmm. and uh, see whatever they can do to um, facilitate themselves but you know uh, that all in my view again is not going to be practically very easy for them now 
and it has to happen as far as this change is concerned because this is now we are looking at next 20 to 50 years going forward how do we see this whole environment of the world now actually um, changing or um, you know uh, bringing about the changes etc so for that america and trump particularly now is very very concerned i think at the moment and definitely he is wanting to look at this uh, china situation and things like that but i hope and inshallah i think this uh, should not really uh, become a hindrance from their side despite whatever they may be trying to do or thinking to do hmm. as it stands today you think that could be one of the area of they concern? will definitely be wanting to do something mm -hmm. because of the environment and the situation looking ahead what it is likely to happen all right do you agree with that sir <laughs> This is how he's looking at well, it. Well, I just see Trump as a reactionary, really. He's an economic reactionary. He may be a businessman, which he inherited most of that. Um, and today we heard that he put an old tycoon uh, head of Exxon as his foreign secretary, foreign secretary. without any government experience. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> it's baffling because the oil industry is going down. You talk about the Treasury Secretary, you yeah. talk about... Uh, I mean, eventually he's going to have a very interesting but, and, and his uh, anti-corporate uh, lead is really not working because he's putting all the corporate lead in his cabinet, which is a, a contradiction in terms. But that aside, I think it's primarily because he wants to reinvigorate his own economy. And he doesn't want his economy, the United States, and that economy to go down relative to China. They're both rising, but it's a matter of rate of rise and relative rate of rise, but China will come up. And... In that respect, strategically speaking, if one country supersedes another economically, it's going to have to protect its resources. Uh, and that's what America sees China doing, protecting its resources. But we fail to, they fail to understand is that uh, one of the most important aspects is that is the everybody wants to... American as, government as we've talked looking about, at China from a very different angle, from a very different... It always has. Do they, do they look at China as, as a threat? It, it always has for a long time. Because it's oncoming. Uh, I, I teach power transition theories, for example, mm -hmm. in global, global uh, strategic power policies, for example, one of the courses I teach mm -hmm. uh, in a, uh, up to PhD level uh, and MPhil level. And, and in that, I talk about power transition theories and what it requires. And th these theories are actually defined primarily by the West through the uh, realist paradigm where uh, a particular country may acquire a certain amount of power, for example, around a ch as a challenger state to the superpower, around 80% of the same equivalent uh, power, and as a result becomes a challenger or is deemed a challenger by the superpower. And as a result, the policies start changing uh, to more of containment and a reactionary policy uh, process starts. In, in other words, you see another as a threat rather than uh, as a partner working towards unification of a world, etc., which is the direction we should be going. Instead of that, you see the short-term vision because you feel under threat, and as a result, you react uh, to immediate threats, and that puts your whole vision out of, uh, out of touch with what you want to do in the long term as a species, as a human species. I'm, I'm looking at the bigger picture here. Mm -hmm. I find that this project, this Obo, One Belt, One Road, and Maritime Silk Road, is the beginning <coughs> of something very great. Uh, and very beautiful for human species if we are willing to last more than a thousand years. And I find that anybody who's anybody in the United States who has a certain amount of vision will have to come on board and not be reactionary. They're just going to delay the inevitable. Now, you see that optim as an optimist, but I'm quite a realist. I realize there are many challenges and there are other conditions the who don't always, like the power balance The changing. potential has always been there. Obviously, uh, Pakistan has been there even Look, before the, be the partition the area was there. But Pratis are very interesting. I, I, I won't take the name, but I'm talking about year 2001 and 2. The deputy chairman, I interviewed him, the de deputy chairman of, of the Planning Commission of Pakistan, and they had this huge document prepared, and everybody was very happy that something is going to happen. So I remember. When you have given the year, everyone got <laughs> the name. Okay, so <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> so I asked him, I asked him that, yeah. well, sir, according to this book, it seems that, you know, this is going to be great for Pakistan. By the way, it was Vision 2020. Uh, so I said, sir, well, just let me imagine if I open my eyes and I'm here 2020, 
Uh, what kind of a country should I expect? Is it some somewhat like Malaysia? No. <laughs> so this is the end of 2016. Three more years, and we're not even one person close to Malaysia. 2001 so. happened, though. This 9/11 happened. Everything changed upside down. So, but but, but well, <laughs> things can change, and people can put spanners in the work because they're looking at relative gains. They're not looking at absolute gains. This is an absolute picture. We're looking at something. But at least for the rest you should of the be world. aligned. But that is what it's important. But, but, but this is what's happening. You see, it's not that easy to change this because the momentum is growing. More countries are interested. More parties want to share in this. More parties want to grow. They're looking at their own economies and they want to part a piece of the pie. And it's mutually. It's not a zero sum. It's not where one wins and the other loses. This is where we can all win. And that's a message. It's a change. The bigger the pie is, the better the share is. It's a narrative that we need to change. And that's, that's a mindset that's we need to change. Your take on that, sir. You know, absolutely, there is a rough can calculation. Um, Abdullah Yusuf Saab is far more you know, aware of these statistics that for every $100 million investment, additional 14,000 jobs are created. Correct. And just multiply $54 billion in terms of job creation opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, who will be benefiting? Pakistani youth, Pakistani labor, Pakistani people. Imagine $54 billion recycling in Pakistan. Direct it multiplies. Benefits. Direct benefits. Mm. Who will be taking the benefits? Pakistani people, you know. This is one thing. The other in the in the bigger thing, as uh, you were but talking. $54 billion may not, I mean, it's a huge sum, may not be a great sum for a country like China for that matter. But for Pakistan, when you compare that amount with the total size of GDP, that's a big chunk. Your total so, earning for the last last year, total exports were around $19 billion. Yes, sir. You know, we missed the targets. Yes. We should see in our own size, according to our own scenario. Mm. Don't go to China that they have 400, 500 billion dollar surplus money and they can spend anywhere in the world. If they are spending, for example, 50 billion dollars for Pakistan, whose annual export is not up even 20 billion dollars, so it's a huge double or triple, triple of mm. your own annual exports, mm. you know, the, the size of Pakistan earning 20, 20 billion dollars in exports and Chinese are spending for example 50 billion dollars. So calculate in that terms you know. So it's a huge project, it's a huge project. Challenges are there, you are very right. I mean if you compare to 2001 and 2 and compare today, uh, things are different. People tend to, to, to paint a negative picture but there are many positive things. For example, your democracy is you know, proceeding forward. This is the third consecutive National Assembly that Great. is going to somehow complete its term. Mean yes, democracy certainly. is moving forward. Certainly. There is respect. Transition is taking place. Transition certainly. is taking, you know, place in Pakistan. Then respect of your institutions in a way is increasing that no institution is intervening into others, you know, paradigm or others domain. There is lot of trouble in Pakistan, it seems, but there is also stability in Pakistan. Uh, every day, some people used to say that PPP government is going to collapse tonight or tomorrow, but somehow five years passed. Five years plus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This government, when we say that political stability is necessary for your economic prosperity, it's interlinked. So political stability somehow is, is uh, holding its ground, you know. Pakistan is on the path of stability means there must be economic activity on the other side and and it's not only both of them they were right it's a win-win scenario for everyone it's not only in the interest of Pakistan and not only in the sole interest of China Pakistan is going to benefit and and those who export to China but Prachas are, up, Prachas up. why do the Indians have a problem why do they oppose CPEC if it's a win-win situation? Is it because of the problems which we have or is it the issue or they don't want us to grow? I mean, there could be multiple <coughs> reasons uh, an Indian sitting here could elaborate it better. But given the relationship between India and Pakistan, obviously anything in the, in the larger uh, positive interest of Pakistan could have some problem over there. Their argument is that since it's passing through a disputed territory, that's why <coughs> they get an additional, you know, argument on this issue. You remember when when World Bank was uh, 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 
willing to to finance this uh, dasu dam you know basha the amar basha dam. Dam. they came up <coughs> with this argument that since it's a disputed territory but uh, these arguments could have been set aside if there had been a good you know relationship between india and pakistan look at the the bilateral trade between china and india it is 80, 80, 80 billion more than 80 billion yes so indians could also benefit from gawadar port if if they are importing from shanghai till mumbai look at the distance <coughs> yeah. and look at the distance between gawadar and, and mumbai it suits mumbai it's actually. so close in fact how many days these trucks got less than a week these trucks originating from kashgar all the way down uh, all the way gawadar, gawadar it was less than a week and if a ship you know departs from for example shanghai, uh, shanghai uh, could have uh, from the malacca islands all that uh, could be 15 20 days two weeks two we more than two weeks hmm. you know it is around you know uh, 8000 miles or 7000 miles distance That's correct, and sir. this is only 2000 mile distance you know so distances oh. they are shrinking opportunities are I'm widening saying. you know okay. indians could have thought it in a in a in a, in a patient manner and they should have thought it the economic prosperity that could accrue from this project but since the relationship is at a pattern at this hour that they are opposing this project but one day i believe if for, for delhi for northern india you know they could also take advantage of gawadar or karachi port from mumbai it takes more time than it could take from Karachi or Gawada to, to Delhi or it's to It's just Northern like because India. you don't we do not have many direct flights. So you go to Dubai first yeah. and then you go to exactly. it's just they're going to exactly. Peshawar first exactly. and then exactly. Peshawar going to Lahore. Exactly. So I think that So there was a very interesting story and in, in, in Don uh, and it was a statement by uh, the former spokesperson of the Foreign Office Ma'am Dasneem Aslam that India is developing nuclear submarines. So obviously you're talking about this entire area, you're talking about the Arabian Sea as well as the Indian Ocean. And then uh, people talk about the presence of Russians in the region as well because they have shown interest. And for sure, Chinese, obviously, they'll be looking after their interest uh, as well. Uh, so a region where you're talking about four major powers, that's Russia, China, India and Pakistan, and all of them, interestingly, are nuclear powers as well. Can that be a potential threat for this region, sir? Well, I certainly hope not in everybody's interest, I would say, because unfortunately, you know, this type of uh, environment that we are seeing today uh, globally, where we are going for war and things like that in different areas for different reasons, I don't see what is the benefit that we get as a result of it for any country. Mm -hmm. You see, now take the case of America. They are behind a lot of these uh, problems that we have in various countries. If you look at their overall situation, I would like to ask them that all this time that you have been investing so much in these areas, what have you actually gained? What have you actually got out of it? I can't understand to be honest. So the philosophy of, of a unipolar world having an absolute control in air, on the sea, on the ground. And even now, the fourth important factor, Dr. Sab is going to agree, is about even the cyberspace. That is another space now. Yeah. So that's what they want, sir. Now, are you actually going to be successful in doing so? Is that going to be a realistic move? Because that is not going to be practical. But sir, because people have that, to. That is a very important point, sir. When you when you when you when you look, look at the global politics, look at the American presence, sir. Starting from Far East, Japan, in, from Germany to to Scandinavia, Middle East, Diego Garcia, you name it, and they're there, sir. So obviously they they have something in their mind. No, no, that's what I'm asking. Looking after the trade routes, looking after the not looking after, but keeping an eye on the even having issues with the Chinese in the southern uh, China Sea. Well, that's what I'm asking now. That's what I'm wanting to know. That since the 45, which was the Second World War, now we had this created this United Nations Forum. And the idea or the concept basically was that we would have an international or a global body who would be there to look after the affairs you know, of all the countries, sort out the problems, etc. And should be an independent body to be should doing be, so. It should have been an independent, it's the most politicized body, sir. Exactly. Now the question is. 
that the we all, all of us know this that it is basically driven by America. Now the question is what is the actual outcome as a benefit I would say for that country which is trying to you know push everything around as far as their interests are concerned. But interests are for everybody and everybody is definitely going to get something out while the, the they are part of the world they are supposed to be also living and you know doing something or are they going to just finish off everybody else is going to just go home and have it doesn't <laughs> happen that way sir how can you actually expect that to be happening yes. so one has to try and come up you think you think times <laughs> have changed now sir because uh, russia certainly when they, when they i mean I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples i mean what's what's the importance of black sea it's a gate it's an opening for for the russians that is the reason they have interest in Syria and Americans, I mean, they ought to keep a check. So they have uh, Turkey as a NATO member, but it has its own issues. We'll have more issues in the future as well. Mm. Remember, Dr. Sam? <laughs> the point is, the point is, sir, uh, but, but, but they have put their foot down. I mean, when you talk about the Crimea issue or you talk about the Ukrainian issue or you talk about the Syrian issue. So there is a challenge. There is a physical challenge for the Americans also. And they mean business, sir. And they, now there was a time they wanted to come and, 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 you know, sort of use these warm waters. Now we're inviting them to use these waters within a, within a span of, let's say, 30 years. So things definitely have changed. Sir, the... <coughs> Excuse me, let me, let me respond. Please, please, this sir. Warm water. Please, you please. know, when, when we compare inviting them or their quest to reach warm water, that has a negative connotation. Mm. That means they want to occupy or they want some kind of invasion or annexation. But when we invite or they show interest in joining this project, it does not carry that negative con connotation. You are right, times have changed and this connotation should also be changed. They are joining CPAC or others joining CPAC is not a quest to occupy those lands as they invaded Soviet Union in 1980s. You know, that was a different okay, perspective. Okay, That's sorry. a different meaning. That has a different connotation. Joining CPAC is not that they are coming to occupy some piece of land here. No, it's a it's a project and, and if other countries can join this project, that's, that's a shared prosperity. Mm -hmm. A uh, uh, couple of important factors. Now, the, the uh, uh, Foreign Minister, Mr. Javad Zarif of, of Iran, and even the President, Mr. Rouhani, when he met uh, the Prime Minister on the sidelines of the UN, they said that um, we want to be a part of it. And, and, and one very important statement that Chabahar is not going to compete, rather it is going to complement. Can you explain how is it going to compete or, or, or how is it going to complement? Well, <clears throat> let's get one thing straight. It can never compete. Why not, sir? Gwadar will have direct access to China because we have a border with China. That's not the case with Iran. So direct access is what China requires, and that's what it's going to get. Mm -hmm. You apply other countries and you go through another border and another border, what you get is more complications, more issues, and you have to understand our relation with China is much deeper, much longer. Um, in that respect, it, may, it simplifies things for China as well. And we're fully on board on top of that. And we're allies on top of that. So as a, as a result of that, we're not going to provide any questions to the Chinese leadership around uh, the fundamentals of this project at all. <coughs> but you look at how Jabahar was initiated and India, etc. It was a challenge. At the beginning, the foundations of this prospect of this port coming up in Iran are seen as a challenge initially anyway. So they've got to completely dispel that before anything happens. That means India's got to get out of the picture. Iran has to ensure that for if they want, if they want to complement and not be a competition. I, I'm to really this. very hopeful about the future of Iran. I mean, look at no, the Iran is growing. The, the, the biggest I mean, deal between the Americans and the but Iranians were about the Boeing deal. 80 billion dollars. That, that, so that, that, that 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 that's how when you but develop things your, are changing your industry. Again. I'm just going to do a, a, a country which was under sanctions. Sir, and yes. Iran has a history. Persia has a history. And as a nation, they survived the struggle, but they, they stood there. <clears throat> you talk about the filmmaking industry, I think they are really improved. Let's not get off point. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, sir, because we talk a lot, we, we talk a lot, but when it comes to the real implementation, there are a lot of problems. There are. Uh, just do the comparison of two airlines. We are still living in the past. Once upon a time, PIA was so good. Well, sir, what about now? 
That is what the problem is. And when you look at the investments which the Iranians are making at the moment, sir, buying 40 ATRs or, or signing a deal with Airbus, I mean, worth billions and billions. I think it's over 11 to maybe 14 Boeing, billion or something. Boeing. And then Boeing again. Mm -hmm. So that means the whole world will come. You know, it's like Samsung. Everybody's invited. <laughs> right now, that deal was done under what the are Obama we doing? administration. Remember that. Yeah? Trump is against the deal. But although he can't change it. Uh, and with the Israeli lobby very strong amongst the Republicans. You know what happened when Netanyahu went and Obama was sidelined, in a way. Yeah, yeah when he addressed the parliament. Uh, the, the Senate. Um, yeah. And, and the fact of the matter is, the whole dynamics are going to change. We don't really know what's going to happen. But he addressed the Republicans so, there, right? So, so there's a lot of issues with that. So there's no guarantees. One of the reasons Boeing was chosen as opposed to Airbus with these deals is primarily to ensure that there's no more sanctions because this deal is now going to provide over 100,000 <coughs> jobs in the America and that's going to cause a lot of problems isn't it in the United States so you can't go against Iran. This has been cleverly done before the Trump administration comes in. But you've got your Iran, yes, uh, lovely country, people are coming up. I wish them the best and I want them to join us but not in opposition and not to support any of our enemies that are going to support they go in opposition to us. Yeah? So uh, in that respect, they need to be very much assuring us they not do anything that will contravene that trust between us and Iran. And That's very important for this project and as a result also with the Chinese because they don't want them to be a span of the work coming then upset the matters. Mm -hmm. We want to join hands together and nothing else. And you were talking about cyber warfare. Yeah? Cyber warfare is the future. And it's, it's happening right now, it's every single day. It, you can't see it. You can't see what's going on. And it'll so get worse. So you do a show on Kashmir, uh, and you just go after India, your program cannot be uploaded. But, but, but we're <laughs> what we're talking about, increasing reality. global reliance on computers and technology, yeah. which means cyber warfare is going to be fundamentally and intrinsically, exponentially more of a threat. And, and I'm sure the, yeah. the Indians, they will be having a lot of edge over that. But perhaps just a last quick comment. India in the future seems to be a country which is going to be having a very strong industrial base after the American investment, after the return of the NRIs as they say, after the economic reforms they are having. I mean, look at their foreign policy, things are really pretty okay for them. I mean, let's, one has to be honest. Uh, but, but the kind of engagement they are having with Iran for that matter, uh, do you think that is going to be an other challenge uh, for, for Gawada? Kind of investment they are making in, in Shah Bahar. I do not think that they also Iran, have a design. I do not think that Iranian will forget the support Pakistan provided when there were clouds of war hovering over Iran on the issue nuclear issue. You know yes. that during the uh, second tenure of George Bush the junior, almost you know yeah, they were ready to go after. They Iran. were ready to go, yeah. but Pakistan at all bilateral, regional or multilateral fora Pakistan opposed any, you know, military solution to the Iranian nuclear program. Other countries but in the present, region... Sir, I'll just give you plus two examples. Excuse One, me, excuse the, the defense I'm, I'm between coming, the two, I'm two countries and I'm, the largest importer of oil I'm from, coming, from Iran. I'm coming to that. Hold on, please. Okay, <laughs> hold on. You know, hold it's, on. It's finishing. <laughs> you got to come back. Other <laughs> countries in the region, once they voted against Iran, even at the level of United Nations, but Pakistan Spurry. did not vote. You know, that's very much there. And Jawad Zarif Saab has been here twice. I met him, you know. The kind of feelings that I could, you know, mm -hmm. infer mm -hmm. were very positive about Pakistan. However, certain gestures of Iran, they are not liked by many in Pakistan. For example, joining hand with India and holding a trilateral summit of Afghanistan, yep. Iran in India and, and Iran in Tehran was not liked by many people Without Pakistan. in Pakistan, you see. Yep. Secondly, when you talk of Gwadar and, uh, and uh, Chobar, Chahabar has certain inherited, inherited disadvantages, certain inherent disadvantages. Mm -hmm. For example, Gwadar is in the open sea, anywhere the ships can, but look at the Chobar inside a region inside a sea where there is a lot of trouble. Mm. So then the the potential of war or potential of instability vis-a-vis -vis Chabahar is far more than it could be in case of Ch uh, Gwadar. So Gwadar is a natural deep seaport. I am not making a comparison. And then thirdly, you know, 
Iranian, they are very wise. They will not go for a competition. That's they are already, you know, talking of cooperation between Gwadar and Chobar projects. When Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and President Rouhani met in September yes. in New York, yep. they talked of a, a, a collaboration of these two ports. It's yes, hardly it is less than 100, each other. hardly 100 kilometer, less than 100 kilometer. And the major power that is, you know, now taken over Gwadar port for functioning of the port, that is Chinese, they are also having a lot of interest in taking over Chaubahar even, you know. So, if Chaubahar and Gwadar, they are working together yeah. in harmony, that will be good for Pakistan, good for Iran. Their, you know, competition in a All negative right. framework is not going to help Chaubahar, I tell you. All right, sir. Prasad, right, thank you very much. Dr. Sab, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you, sir. Abdullah Yusuf. Uh, that's all we have uh, for this hour. I'll see you tomorrow at 8. Till then, you take good care of yourself. Khudafiz.